Welcome to The Real Build. I am your host, Bill Ryman, your broker builder. And today we are doing something a little bit different than usual. I'm actually doing panel discussion with some past guests that I had on the show. Um, I'm going to have them each introduce themselves. So let's start with uh, Damien Heim. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm Damien Heim. I'm the owner of Handmade Homes in Oklahoma City. We build energy efficient homes. I uh, usually do 20 houses a year or so, 30, something there in that area. Thank you, Damien. Welcome back. Good Thanks. to have you again. And then uh, we'll go to Brad, Brad Blair. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so my wife and I own a company called Spruce Homes up in Canada. Uh, we build infill developments, so mainly in core neighborhoods of our city. We, we buy a house, tear it down, subdivide the lot, and build two houses up on top. So we build infill construction. Uh, we, do, we flip houses as well, and then also do custom renovations for families. Um, and we've been doing that for four years now. Awesome. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for coming back on again. And finally, Jake Armstrong. Hey, thanks for having me. Jake Armstrong. We own Revive Properties. We're in the uh, Destin, Florida, the Florida Panhandle. We specialize in mainly large remodeling projects. So we do a lot of home, condo renovations. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really what we specialize in is mainly remodeling. Awesome. And it's good to have you back too, Jake. So obviously with this one, I wanted to switch it up a little bit, have everybody on and then kind of cover all different topics. Uh, some of them we've brushed on in past episodes, but dive a little bit deeper into them with uh, everybody on and different opinions and so on and kind of just deliver the value we did on past episodes to the customer. So with that being said, let's get started on a big topic and that is design trends. So what are we all seeing uh, is the best design strategy for the customers? What kind of trends are you guys seeing? Um, I'm sure a lot of us are seeing the same thing, but I'd love to hear it. So whoever wants to go first, go right into it. Well, here in Oklahoma City, modern farmhouse seems to be the, the thing, houses with more siding, maybe a little bit of metal roofing, uh, more modern interior, um, and more farmhouse exterior. Cool. Everybody, what, uh, Brad, what are you seeing where you're at? Um, so we do, the majority of the work that we've been doing the past 12 months uh, has all been custom work. And the one thing that we try and tell people is just like, be unique to you. Um, whatever you like, we'll find a way to mash it together. Um, I would say if you brush everything with a broad stroke that modern farmhouses is, is very popular up here as well. I think HGTV has just made it that way. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's kind of a blend between the modern farmhouse and more, more of just modern like sleek clean lines. It seems to be one or the two. And we try and help people blend things so that they feel like when they move in, they went and picked out everything that they like um, so they can take inspiration from maybe a few different things and we help mold them all together. Um, everything through, through cabinetry, flooring, exterior, light fixtures, all of that kind of thing. There's a lot of opportunity to mold different trends together. Um, so that's really one of the things that we try and push on people is whatever, whatever you like, like be true to that. Don't necessarily do what you see on TV, but the trend definitely is going modern farmhouse. Um, slash like sleek lines and design is what we're seeing up here awesome and then jake what do you what are you seeing as far as in the remodel world yeah so we're um destin florida it's a it's a beach town in the uh in the florida panhandle so we still get a lot of the farmhouse you know requests but i'm seeing a lot of the farmhouse kind of mixed in with the beach style so we'll do a lot of the you know the ship lap uh, we'll do shaker cabinets. We'll do, you know, quartz countertops. But at the same time, we're implementing a lot of like blues and, um, you know, light blues, light greens, just to kind of incorporate, you know, that Gulf of Mexico color. So, um, you know, we, we do get a lot of the requests for the farmhouse. But uh, as I said, a, a lot of our clients want to try to mix in the, the beach field uh, with, their, with their renovation. 
Yeah, and I'm kind of similar, obviously, being in Florida and southwest Florida down here. Um, a lot of coastal contemporary. I'm starting to see a little more contemporary, but still a lot of coastal, a lot of blues. I'm seeing a lot of shift to the green color, too. Uh, that's uh, we, But we're kind of still a little, uh, actually, a little kind of different, different trends and everything. I'm doing a super modern one, and then we're doing super coastal ones. I finished a farmhouse one. And then I also still believe it or not have a Mediterranean one. Shocker. I know you don't really see the Tuscan <laughs> look too much anymore, but we have one. So it's actually, it's cool to see all different kinds going up too. Um, anything else on that topic with anybody that you guys can think of design? Well, I was going to say, I haven't really, I haven't, I haven't done too much modern stuff yet. I don't know if it's, um, you know, if it's coming in this, in this area, I'm, I'm guessing it is, but um I, I take that back i've done a couple you know high white gloss kitchen cabinets and, and stuff like that but most of our stuff um we're really not doing too much of the of, of the real contemporary the real modern stuff so it, it may just be you know the little bubble that we're in you know being so close to the beach just uh, like i said all, all the white shaker all the, the the light blues the light greens but um i've done, done very few of the contemporary or, or modern style stuff but uh I don't know, maybe three months ago or so, I met with a, uh, a draftsman designer, the owner of a draftsman firm. And uh, he told me in this area, we hadn't even hit the tip of the iceberg on the modern farmhouse. He said, we're late to the game. Here in Oklahoma, we're usually a little late to the game anyway. So um, he said, but the next thing coming that he's seeing trending is going to be uh, Texas Hill Country. Interesting. And then Texas Hill, what, what's, what's Texas Hill Country? Just dive a little deeper into so, that. You take your farmhouse, you get rid of the siding, and you put a bunch of stone on it. Okay. Uh, so it's a lot of uh, limestone features. Um, and then you mix your modern in. You might have the, uh, you know, the western doors, uh, the manufacturer western door with the sliding doors that hide it in the wall, and things like that nature cool uh, probably a little bit more metal roof different basically what you would see um, for me it's close so what i would see when i go to texas there you go awesome gotcha. awesome and um another jumping on a different topic here very important um on our next subject here very important to pretty much all customers because we deal with it every day cost so cost is important to a lot of our customers. How can we make it so that customer, you know, let's get into the add-ons and the, the upcharges, stuff like that. How can we make it as builders and remodelers to make that happen less? Because as you guys know too, you know, it's kind of hard, you know, especially in custom building um, to really pinpoint a price. Uh, you can do a fixed price all you want, but they're going to, still select something but how can we make that happen less to kind of help the customer out so the one the one thing that i i try really hard when i'm uh first starting and and talking with people is to gauge to gauge what their expectations are through the words that they use um you can kind of tell what type of um i guess you could say quality that they expect or before they even actually vocalize it you can just tell by like the kind of people that they are um we do mid-grade materials um and you can i can always tell if someone's going to want to upgrade based on what our standard materials are and everything is customized they have their choice of the mill basically for the materials they can use so if i sense that somebody has has a more expensive taste then before i even send them a price i just increase some of our allowances um, for that exact reason. I don't want somebody to think that they can get the kitchen of their dreams. And then I set an allowance that I just don't think is going to fit. Um, cause all that happens, you get halfway through the build process and they're not static about their house. Um, so that's one of the things that I try and do. I try and gauge their sense of, I guess kind of what they expect without even really asking because there is ways to do that. Um, and then really just making sure that we set, we set allowances for all of their selections to just make sure that they're high enough. 
Um, it's way better. It feels way better to send a, send a change order and tell them they're saving money than to tell them they have to upgrade price because of the countertops they pick. So. I think, I think you nailed it. It's when you first are meeting and discussing the plans and the changes to the plans and all that, if you pay attention to what they're asking you for, you can get a really good read on what they're after. The other thing is, is most of the time, somebody who comes to me wanting to build a house, they've seen what I built. They've been to one of my houses um, and we build multiple product lines. So some are higher end, some are lower end. Uh, so they know what to expect for where they're going. You know, so like we encourage everybody before we even sit down, hey, go take a look at one of the houses in this neighborhood. That's the, what you get in that price point. Um, if that's not to your liking, let us know and we'll show you what you get at the next price point. And it works out well because then there's no surprises. They've actually physically seen what they're going to be getting. Uh, they can see the level of the product as far as the, the trim work, the cabinets, the granite, you know, take your pick. Um, but then I also, if we have a customer come in, say they don't like the four or five different plumbing fixtures that they get to choose from, I put the homework back on them. Find me a model number and a manufacturer of what you want. I'll price it out for you. If it's the same, great. If it's more, we'll discuss it. Um, if we want to take away from one to cover this, that's fine. Or we'll figure out what works and, you know, you may have to pay an upgrade, but you may not. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's great. A couple, uh, both of you hit some great points, you know, expectations from the beginning or, or I think they're crucial. Um, you know, with, with our company renovating a lot of condos and second homes, we don't always have the, the availability to go actually touch and, um, you know, our previous projects, but I'll still put it back on the client. Hey, send me pictures of stuff that you like, you know, send me some cabinet styles that you like, send me some countertops you like, send me some backsplash you like. That allows me to do some research on my end. Okay. You know, they like these high end quartz countertops. Okay. You know, they're a hundred dollars square foot for, you know, these countertops. Are you okay with that? Or can I help you find something that's $60 a square foot? that, you know, I, I think you'd still be happy with. So uh, exactly. I kind of put it back on the customer as well. Hey, just, just send me stuff that you like. And then I can, on my end, do my research and help them really narrow down the price. So, um, but like I said, it, um, Brad said it, you know, setting those expectations from the very beginning. Uh, I think that's, I think that's huge. Yeah, that's huge. And one of the other things we do is all of their allowances go to our interior designer that we hire to work with every customer. So she has the allowances. She knows she's been doing it long enough and she's awesome. She knows yeah. how far that dollar figure will go and how to manipulate it to make it get them what they want. Yeah, that's spot on right there too, because if they know the allowances ahead of hand and go to the suppliers and everything too, that definitely helps out with the customer with surprises too. But one thing that you guys said is upping the allowances a little bit more too is one thing that I've noticed has helped. Cause I mean, I use other similar jobs in the past. That's kind of what I have to go off of. Sometimes it's hit or miss doing that, but you know, you try and up it a little bit depending on how long ago that job was. And it's much better to give a credit back rather than an upcharge. Cause they're going to be a lot happier that way too. So as far as allowances, though, um, just so everybody knows, um, what are you mainly focusing on as far as giving allowance to what parts of the bill? Just to brush on that a little bit. So well, it's their house, right? So theoretically, in, in actuality, they pick everything. Mm -hmm. Now, we try to make it easy. So earlier I mentioned, you know, we have four or five different plumbing lines, product lines. They're all within the same manufacturer, but you have five to choose from. Uh, uh, we have a tile showroom, you know, as long as you stay in that room, for the most part, you're within your allowance. Um, so like for flooring, we say within builder standard, 
when they meet with the designer, she's going to take them and show them everything that's in standard, which is 90% of that room. There's another room there. If you go in there, you're going to be paying an upcharge. We know that that room is an upgrade room, um, but we have such an abundance of flooring options that are within the builder standard that maybe twice we've had customers that just couldn't find it and had to go into that room. Um, lighting, uh, our designer again, she's awesome. She knows how to take what they're after. Um, you know, before they meet, we always have them get a Pinterest file or a house file with the things that they like so Blake can understand what their tastes are. And then when they go to the lighting center, again, the designer has the allowance just as well as they do. She's already done her homework. And when she walks in there, she's got an idea in her head of we can do these things together and keep you within your budget. And they're all things either the same or very similar to what you had in your, in your uh, file that you shared with me, you know, of the style that you want. And then, you know, sometimes she misses one light. Like, you know, they just don't like it. That's fine. We just take that one out. And she knows to show them other similar fixtures to the one that they like within that price point. Um, so I think for us, the designer has been a, a real key to helping us keep people within that budget. But um, even more so, we don't focus on one specific thing as far as allowances go. Um, a lot of things are just per plan, especially on the custom side. You know, uh, on the custom side, you can pick everything in your house. You can move the walls around before we start, you know. We try to get all that done before we ever start. So that way, once we start, or again, we've met the expectation. There's no upcharges coming. Uh, and we have communicated back and forth. So I know what their allowance needs to be. And I'm not having to go to them and go, guys, you're outside your allowance. Awesome. Anybody else on that topic? Well, one, one thing I'll add real quick is um, I think we've all kind of hit on it, just how important all the pre-planning and all the stuff before you even start, you know, picking up a hammer or knocking down walls, all the stuff that's done before you, you know, all the, all that stuff before you even start doing work on the project, all the materials, you start considering those, you know, you know where's, where's this exact wall going to go? You know, if we're changing the kitchen layout, you know, where's the plumbing, where's the electrical, electrical going to go? even just considering allowances and, you know, what allowance items you have. I was talking to somebody the other day who uh, they just fired their contractor. The contractor didn't have any allowances. He didn't give them any allowances. And, you know, th three weeks into the project, uh, the contractor's already telling his people they, you know, they owe him an extra $3,000 just three weeks into a contract. So um, my thing is, you know, just before you even start doing any work, just that communication and all the planning that's done, before you even do anything, it's it's crucial. It sets the expectations, like Brad said, and um, it just gets everyone on on the same page. And I just think that's you know that's that's huge. Awesome. And so let's dive into you know something basically off of that topic. So what 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 other surprises come you know with building a home so you know as far as you know, we just discussed cost and everything like that but how can we deal with this and how can we prevent any kind of surprises for for me the biggest surprises uh have come from not planning well enough like not saying not bringing things up to their attention that they might want and they just aren't thinking about because for us, uh, a ninety percent of the people we're building for um, are first-time home buyers, so they've never built a home. Lots of them have never lived on their own. This is like they used to live with mom and dad, and now they're buying a house, um, or they lived in an apartment or something like that. So they've never never had a whole space to themselves. So there's not. Uh, I need to be aware of that and make sure that. 
I'm bringing up things that they may not think about, which sometimes means change orders and upgrades. Um, but it's way easier to do that beforehand than it is after the house is drywalled or after they moved in. They're like, oh, I wish I would have done that. Cause I always tell people like, look, you're building a house. Um, and for the most part it is customized. So you have the option. Like these walls are open. You want to add like minor things, something that's happened a lot in the last 12 months. Uh, everybody has a Dyson. It seems like all of a sudden, uh, which is ironic because first time home buyers can afford $600 Dyson's, which is ironic, <laughs> uh, but they want a place to hang their Dyson. So they need a plug in, which is they would need it like kind of eye height. Well, you're normally not going to have an eye level plug in somewhere. So like, okay, well, let's make sure we have that somewhere. Um, things like USB plugs so they can plug their phones in kind of everywhere. Um, we're doing voice activated electrical now in some houses. Um, so just like bringing up all that stuff more, I've noticed the more that I can bring up and stir up thoughts in people's minds in the planning stage, that's just less headache from a project management standpoint once everything's already flowing. Cause everybody knows that once you get into the flow of things, it's tough to be like, Oh, last minute we want to add this. Or I had that today. We had an ensuite window that was planned to be installed uh, vertically. And last second we changed it to be horizontal. Well, it's like now I have the casement opening the wrong way. Now I have to order another one for awning. That was my mistake for not being clear from the beginning. So the more things that can be thought about up front, the better. I kind of took it the other direction when you asked the question, what surprises and how can we prevent them? I'm thinking more of negative surprises, like unexpected events happening. Um, for us, hailstorm. Mm -hmm. What happens? Well, we hold the insurance, we hold the risk. So hailstorm we we'll replace the roof right um and it, there's not much you can do about an act of god mm -hmm. but there's things that you can do about other things like theft right did did the builder lock the house up that night the appliances got stolen they were in the garage next day they're not in the garage um that's kind of the the route i went with the question is you know negative surprises um, and most of them can be nipped in the butt right from the beginning by picking the right builder, picking somebody who cares, is going to lock everything up, going to make sure things are being done, you know. Um, but even the best guys have delays. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one that we have right now. Water meter is under the street. <laughs> That's where the tap is. I didn't install that tap, but I can't put water on the house. Mm -hmm. So I can't tile, I can't brick, you know, no water. So rather than stopping while we're figuring out how we're gonna cut the street open and tap it and pull it back out into the, into the lot where it belongs, while we're figuring all that out, we went and bought the equipment needed to have water on the job site to be able to continue moving because these people have a deadline, you know? Um, so I think there's always, you know, in construction, there's always surprises. Um, I think that uh, as long as the builder has a solution for that surprise that doesn't hit the customer's pocketbook and doesn't affect the quality. And I think it's not, not really as, as big of a deal as um, say something that, that builder didn't care and it just costs the customer more money, you know? Yeah, well, it's almost like Brad said too, it's almost like in the communication up front too. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, obviously you're gonna have your acts of God, um, you're gonna have your certain issues along the way uh, for us, for example, you guys, not so much, but we have pilings. One thing I always have to explain is I don't know how deep your pilings are going to go. They drive them down till they hit a solid part. Some builders give an allowance for pilings. I think our way is a little more fair. We give up to 12 feet. You know, anything after 12 feet, you're going to have to pay per foot this amount. 
you know, same with dirt here. Dirt's really expensive down here. We live on an island. They got to truck it in uh, all the way up uh, two hours north of us, two and a half hours, you know. So that's the surprises I like to tell right off the bat, you know, are seawalls too. Is the seawall okay? Is the seawall not okay? Let's deal with that prior to the build stuff like that so it can happen in all kinds of different ways like you're saying too you know you got to know what to expect throughout the build over the course of it i mean we could have a hurricane down here we had irma a couple of years ago and that was a surprise surprise you know what i mean we got a major <laughs> storm coming our way hunker down we got to lock everything up so um you know that's the kind of things that you know people can deal with here along with during the build too you just don't know some of it but we try and handle it as much as possible with as much communication before and throughout the process too like you were saying damien too yeah. hey on that um you know on the hurricanes we're still we're still kind of dealing with hurricane michael here in the florida panhandle as far as um you know shortage of labor you know it's, it's hard to find good workers um, one thing I was going to say regarding the remodeling, I think it's kind of notorious for, you know, the scary stuff. What do you, what happens when you start pulling out cabinets, pulling out, you know, knocking down walls. So um, I think it goes back to the communication for us before we even sign a contract, you know, have some contingencies set aside. Um, you know, I can, I can do some things on my end to see if there's going to be any issues, you know, floor might be, you know, not level or there might be some soft drywall, something like that that show me that there might be some issues, but still there's several times I pull out cabinets and there's, you know, all sorts of mold behind the cabinets. People are covering up shoddy work. So um, for, for me and my clients, I, I tell them, hey, just have some contingency money set aside. Uh, you know, I know you don't want to hear this, but, but no matter all the projects I've done, I've, I've had some sort of issue that comes up. I've never had a perfect project. So I'm not telling you that to scare you, just know that an issue might come up, we're going to, you know, handle it the right way and not necessarily mean it's going to cost you thousands of dollars, but have a little money set aside in case something does come up. And, you know, when it comes up, we'll, we'll, we'll keep rocking and rolling and move forward and, uh, you know, deliver a good product at the end. So. Anything else on that topic? I think it still comes back to the communication. Like, uh, one of the things that we do also is we set um, a possession date to the beginning of the build, but I tell people up front, like, look, that's floating. <laughs> like, I'm not saying it's going to be done. Uh, and back to your point, Damien, about, about weird stuff and weather. Last winter we had, here's a question for you guys. What, at what temperature, how cold did it have to be for you guys to shut down? It was minus 40 here for six weeks over the winter time. Yeah, we don't get too cold. Just we don't like, get too cold here. <laughs> we get cold, but we don't get nothing like that. Uh, our thing is shut down as an ice storm. Yeah. So anyway, so so for six weeks, we and our, we had guys who who stopped working for a couple weeks, but they ended up going back. But they, you can't work as efficiently, obviously, when you can't feel your fingers after being outside for twenty minutes. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but. But it just comes back to the communication. They were fine with it. We had no issues with, with the people we were building at that, at, during that time because they knew up front, like, this was the temporary possession date, but it floats. And they understood that you can't work in 40 below weather. So, so how do you get your air compressor to work at negative 40 degrees? <laughs> you know, that's, moisture, right? that's a good question. There's a lot of grease. I, think. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. How, I don't think the, the framing guys... They, that's what was happening during it. They're framing and, uh, and plumbing and electrical. Electrical would be the worst, like with your, working with your fingers when it's that cold. But they got it done. It was actually ironic. We were building, uh, there's another builder building uh, two or three houses down. And they shut down during that entire time. We only shut down for like six days, I think. And we ended up finishing our build. Well, they're still building right now. Our clients moved in May 15th and they're still finishing theirs. <laughs> so yeah we we might have to shut down when it's 50 degrees here man people don't know how to operate down here in that kind of... <laughs> it's florida man we're not used to that so on the next topic 
how can we make the building process better? So kind of going off the last thing, but diving a little deeper here from start to finish, what can we all do as builders and remodelers to make the process a better experience for the customer? Communication. I mean, that's what it all boils down to. Um, there's going to be times where as the builder, you got to call your customer and tell them something they don't want to hear. You still got to call them. Don't wait on it. It's not going to get any better. Yeah. Waiting. Uh, there's also going to be times where you, you get to call them and tell them something that they really wanted to hear. Hey, we're moving your closing up. You get to move in early, you know? Um, but I think it all boils down to communication. Um, the more you communicate with the customer, the better you're going to be able to read. Are they a hands-on person? They don't want to be out there all the time. Some people don't. Some people don't want to be in there at all. They just want to see it when it's done and, and enjoy it from there. Other people want to have involvement all the way through. So for us, we try to hit in the middle, right? Nobody's limited to, you can only come to your house five times, right? The thing that we ask is that you uh, let us know that you're wanting to come out so that you can, uh, that way you can get your, uh, oh, your realtor or the builder to come out in the event that the guys are working overhead, we don't want you in there where you get hurt, find a stopping point and then bring you in. So I think it's all about communication. Uh, uh, yeah, I agree. Um, it comes back to what we were talking about before. So like preparation, planning, and communication. The more you can plan out ahead of time, the better. Uh, we use uh, we use a software called Mobile Trend. I don't know if any of you guys use it or similar similar softwares out there, so that they can always see what's going on, uh, what to expect as we're moving scheduled items. They can see that we're moving scheduled items. Um, if there's any changes throughout a project, or if there's any like specialty items that we need them to pick that we can't pick up front. Um, or like locations of things. We always do electrical walkthroughs specifically to make sure like, Hey, is this actually where you want your, your plugs? For example, your receptacles, like you actually, how wide is your bed? Uh, let's make sure that they're like exactly where you want. We can easily move them like one stud space this way or the other at this point in time. Um, so it comes down to that. It comes down to transparency and it comes down to like actually just helping them. Cause like I said, for us, the large majority are first time home buyers and definitely they're all first time home builders and they don't know what to expect. They don't know what the process is like. They don't know the cost of things. They don't know why you have to install things certain ways or, or code. Um, so just helping them through that entire process is, is from my perspective, what makes that process uh, better and, and more enjoyable. Yeah, I agree. I think communication is the most important component. Um, I'm sure y'all use, you know, certain programs as well, but um, I use a 3D rendering program to really help the client visualize their, you know, what their kitchen is going to look like. Because I found that a lot of clients have a hard time visualizing, you know, the final, the final product. So um, just really helping them visualize what their kitchen, what their bathroom, just the whole layout, what it's going to look like. Um, I, I think it just makes them feel a little bit more comfortable about the project and the construction process in general. Yeah, communication is big. And then like Brad said too, kind of guiding them through the process too. We do a lot of walkthroughs. We'd actually do uh, multiple. I mean, if they have questions too, we like to meet them on the job site too. So they could actually, you know, if they're in town, that is too. Uh, most of them are willing to come in town because it's a big investment on their part too. And they want to see reality because seeing reality is always better than seeing a picture. Uh, but we try to do as much, you know, on site hands on as possible. Um, going over everything, electrical walkthrough, low voltage walkthrough. I just did one today actually. Uh, so we kind of walked through on that one prior to drywall. And then after that too, with some other stuff, um, so we just try and get them in front of the house as much as possible so nothing's missed. 
and then answer as many questions as possible too. Most of the time they're calling me on that because I was with them at the beginning. So I get the privilege of dealing with it throughout the process, answering any kind of questions too. Um, so yeah, communication's a big deal too and guiding them on, on, in my perspective too. Uh, anything else on that one? No. Okay. So let's talk marketing, um, you know, marketing strategy, stuff like that. So how can we market better to our potential customers? And what are some ways you guys are marketing to the customer? I hired a firm to do it. <laughs> yeah. I just be honest. <laughs> I hired a firm to do it. I, that's not my specialty. My specialty okay. is something else. I don't know marketing. So let's talk, well, what about so if you're not marketing, what are you doing? Let's see. Let's, we talked about this a little bit last time I interviewed you after the fact too, with, with the after communication and, and maybe referral marketing, stuff like that. What are you doing as far as that aspect? We do a, uh, a quality assurance program after the fact, um, here in Oklahoma, just about every builder has got a one year builder's home warranty. Um, it's if you read it it's actually 13 months long the uh the way that it works uh customer has a warranty request something that they feel is is covered under their warranty they notify their builder um, builders to send a representative out to look at it make sure it's qualified or covered um, and then as long as it's covered make the adequate repairs okay so with that theory the customer's got to contact the builder. We don't do that. We contact you. People get in their house, they're living there, they forget about something little minor scratch in the wall that's been there since they moved in. Their movers didn't do it. Everybody just overlooked it. It was behind a door or something. And, you know, they, they see it and they go, oh, I'll call him tomorrow. And then they forget about it for a week or two. Oh, I'll call him tomorrow. So rather than do that, what we do is we send out notifications. Uh, three months after you move in, send you an email asking if everything's good to go in your house. And if it isn't, please send us a list of anything that you can get us to come address. Um, six months, same thing. 12 months, same thing. That gives us a 30-day window while we're still within their warranty period. Um, and then with the 12 months, we also send them a survey. Um, and what we do on that survey is just ask them how the program went, um, how their build process went, if they built with us or if they bought a home, how the buying process go, um, how the warranty process go. Um, it's a good judge for me to know how we are doing. Um, because if, if nobody ever says to you, hey, you, you're slacking at this, whatever this is, you're gonna go on with the assumption that you're doing just fine with that. So we like to use that as a gauge to, to grade ourselves and know where we need to step it up. So, um, and then the, the second half of that is, we want all of our customers to tell all their friends who built their house. And if they're not satisfied, they're not telling their friends, or at least they're not telling them to come have me build their house. Right. So we want them all to be satisfied. So we want to make sure that we take care of everybody um, so that we earn the right to ask them for a referral business. Awesome. Anybody else? We, um, I kind of put it on my wife to, or she actually stepped up to uh, do social media for our, um, for our company. So, She'll handle the Facebook page. Um, we're, we're just now kind of getting started on the Instagram page. Um, one thing I've been trying to do lately is just go out, shake people's hands, and you know, have face-to-face -face conversations. Um, I've, in this area, there's a lot of real estate agents, uh, a lot of interior designers. So I, I try to make it. Uh, I try to put it on my calendar. You know, once a week, go have lunch with a new real estate agent, a new interior designer, just to get my name out there and see. If they have any clients that I can help out in any way. So just trying to get out there and, you know, you know, shake somebody's hand and meet them face to face. Um, our, our community, the Destin area, it's 
Um, the summertime, it's very busy with the tourists, but in the wintertime, um, you know, word of mouth is, is very big um, in, in the community. So uh, for me, it's just getting, getting my name out there, meeting people face to face. For, uh, for us, so my wife does, she's our designer and our marketer. Um, and we realized uh, maybe like two years ago now that we only sell houses to millennials. That's it. <laughs> Uh, literally we've sold houses to no one other than millennials the entire time we've been in business. Um, so when that switch hit, we realized, well, number one, so the thing in marketing, you have to know who your customer base is, you know, have to know what they want, you know, have to know where their attention is. So we've, we realized millennials are who we sell to. We figured out what they want. They wanted, um, a well-designed house. It's built with quality, but they're, they're more concerned about what the eye can see than what the eye can't see. Um, so older generations I find are more concerned with the efficiency of the furnace, um, how good the insulation is behind the walls, the air conditioning units, all of the mechanical stuff, um, the longevity of the roof, the, whether the siding, whether they do like a fiber cement board versus a vinyl because they want it to last longer and they want it to be more durable. That seems to be what older generations care about more than necessarily the design and millennials are flipped. They care more about what it looks like than, than the other stuff that they can't see. Um, but once you realize that, then you can attack exactly and you can market and you can attack what they want. Um, so that's what made us go all in with social media. Um, we put virtually zero money into anything but social media and we just go hard on it. Um, because we realize who our customer base is, we realize what they want and we know where their attention is. Um, and we've attacked that as hard as we can. So we've done that with like, we do Instagram and Facebook, um, probably equally. We run, we don't run many Instagram ads, mainly Facebook ads. Um, but we've done things like brand ambassadors, things like that, um, to, to increase our local social media presence. Um, and for us, that's what, that's, what's worked. And depending on your, on your customer base, I think you have to model what your marketing looks like, uh, to fit what they're looking for and where they're looking. Yeah. Believe it or not. I'm we're like me and you have talked about in the past. We're polar opposite of you. We're more baby boomer, right? And especially now retiree stuff like that. But believe it or not, too, they're actually on social media platforms now. Uh, not so much Instagram, but Facebook. Uh, a lot of YouTube. I figured that one out, too. They like watching YouTube. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I know. So, I mean, email marketing, YouTube video, stuff like that. That's what I've been doing a lot of, a lot of walkthrough. They like to see you walk through on homes and actually you explain stuff, too. I've gotten a lot of good feedback on that um on the marketing end too but um yeah it's i mean when it comes down to everything too it really does come down to building a quality product uh and a lot of them are looking for that in the reputation and after the you know um and word of mouth after the fact and referral and stuff like that too and how you handle a customer like damien said too um anything else on that topic on the, okay. So, uh, are diving into something else here, are there things customers can add to their homes that can increase uh, resale value? I know on me and Jake's episode, we talked about this more on the remodeling end, um, but is there anything that they can add to their homes that is going to increase resale value? Because a lot of them are about resale too, especially down here. Uh, they might say they're going to, you know, live in the home forever, but you never know what's going to happen. So that's what we try and focus on too, as we're in planning stages and everything, whether they should add another bath here or do this there. What are you guys seeing on that end? Well, around here, the average person lives in a home for seven years before they move on average. So when a customer comes in and we're going through the floor plan, I will let them know if I think they're doing something to do that plan that's going to make it difficult. And I remind them that the average person is here for seven years in this home and then they move on to their next home. Um, 
But with that said, you know, it, it is a custom home, so you still want it specific to your needs. Um, but room layouts would be a good, to, good one to watch how you lay your rooms out. I mean, if it's only desirable to one in 10 people, and you know you're going to sell it in five to ten years. It's probably not something you want to do. Um, I think uh, the other things that you can do to add value, there's a multitude of things, right? Like around here we have ice storms. People are without power for a long period of time. Generator could add value. Um, a lot of people will put a pool in to add value, but it costs more than the value that it adds. Uh, uh, after that, I think it's creature comforts and who is it adding value to? Is it adding value to the home or is it adding value to the end user? Uh, for example, my wife loves to cook, right? Our standard appliance package is, uh, 36 inch gas cooktop well i know that she just loves cooking she enjoys it it's what she likes to do so when i built our home i upgraded the appliance package right she's got a 48 inch commercial range in her kitchen and does it work any better than the, the other one to me no because i'm not a cook i don't Turn it on, it gets hot. Turn it off, it gets cold. Perfect. But you can tell the difference. So did it add value? May not have added value to the price of the house, but it added lots of value to me because my wife's happy. Yeah, I agree. I, I always say that value is in the eye of the beholder. People value things differently. Um, so the things that we try and do is we try and just do little things uh, maybe, maybe five to 10 little small things that other people, uh, who are building alongside us aren't doing. So <clears throat> mainly those are things like, uh, manipulating cabinets, countertops, tile, flooring. Um, those are the main things. So like one, one example, white cabinets here is like a dime a dozen. They're everywhere. So I'm like, mm -hmm. let's not put white cabinets in. Let's do something a little bit different. Everybody also does uh, cabinet heights, upper cabinet heights up to seven feet. I'm like, let's go eight or let's go, let's go nine. Um, let's go to the ceiling. Let's put glass in it. Let's do something that's different than everybody else is doing um, that can make your cabinets stand out. Cabinets is the number one thing. And it doesn't cost a whole arm and a leg more to go like that extra 2%. Um, things like tiles. Like you can... You can get the exact same tile as the next house, but if you just lay it a little bit differently, it stands out. So instead of doing like a bricklay pattern, we've recently done a couple patterns where it's bricklay, but we just do it on the diagonal in the, in the room. And it makes like a massive difference. All of a sudden people are like, oh, that's cool. Well, it's like, it's the exact same tile. It's just laid in a different way. So it's just like small things like that. Um, upgrading light fixtures. I always tell people like light fixtures make a massive difference in your room. It'll make your house look um, way more unique and they're easy. Those are things that are easy to change out. So like if you like a light fixture, but the next person doesn't, all you have to do is take it down and put it back up. You're not hindering the value of the home at all. Um, but you will make it stand out towards the house next door because it doesn't look cookie cutter. Uh, so those, those little things, if you can just do that throughout the entire process makes a big difference, um, when it comes to resale. So I think, I think my market's a little different. So we renovate a lot of uh, condos and second homes. So a lot of our clients are looking, you know, hey, in two, three, four years, I want to possibly unload this property. And in the meantime, I want to have a lot of renters coming through. So, you know, with that being said, we do a lot of neutral colors. Um, you know, a lot of our walls are very neutral. Uh, good thing about paint, you know, you can paint pretty cheap. Um, at the same time, we add a few little elements in almost all of our projects, you know, shiplap. Shiplap makes a, it's a, it makes a big impact and it really doesn't cost that much. So we, we add small little features like that. Brad hit on, you know, light fixtures. Light fixtures 
um, they make a big impact and they're not, you know, you need light fixtures, they're not going to break the bank. So um, we do a lot of neutral stuff. Um, we, we spice it up with the ship lap and a few little things like that. But a lot of our clients are looking to possibly sell it in a few years. Um, so, you know, when they consider the flooring, when they consider the cabinets, a lot of times I encourage them, hey, go with something neutral. You can always spice up your property by art, by, um, you know, furnishings, you know, pillows. Um, so I, I think ours is a little bit different just based on our, our vocation and our clients use for the property. Anything else on that topic guys? I'm going to keep, keep on moving along here. So we all talked about, uh, quality and, and all the past episodes with you guys. So let's dig deeper into this. What are some things we can do to deliver the best product at a fair price? So the one thing that we do, um, we have, I think this is the biggest impact that we've made from a quality standpoint. So we have standard materials, standard mechanical equipment, standard insulation. We have like a standardized list of materials that we use to build our houses. If somebody wants to upgrade from our standard, we do all upgrades at cost. Um, so essentially we've done, because it takes, whether you're putting uh, whatever, our our 12 bats or our 20 bats in, in a house, it takes no more added effort. It's just changing the number on the order form. Um, so we don't, we don't mark up any upgrades. Um, and that's along the whole process. So that, that gives our clients the biggest opportunity to, to upgrade whatever quality they want for at whatever cost we can get it for. Um, and I think for us, hands down, that's the, the best way we've been able to get higher quality options into our clients' hands at the most affordable price that we can. Anybody else? For us, we're members in different buying groups and building groups. Um, and with that comes buying power. Um, so when we get better pricing, it's easier to pass that pricing along. Um, you know, spec houses, that's a little bit different game than what, what we've been talking about where you have a spec house that you're, you're building it to the price point of the neighborhood. Um, the comps in that neighborhood, they realistically dictate what that house is selling for. But on a custom home, that buying power that you have helps you to be able to give the customer the best price that they can get. Yeah, on the, um, so I, I'm also a dealer for several different cabinet companies. So going along with the buying power, you know, a lot of times I will, I'll pass those cabinet prices on to the clients. Um, I see it as, you know, we're in these projects four, five, six months. Um, you know, we can't always get everything pinned down from the very beginning. So I don't feel that we should necessarily punish the homeowner and gouge the homeowner if they want to make a change. Um, you know, we got to go through the rest of this project together. Um, so I, I just don't, you know, I, I try to, as much as I can, pass those savings on to the, to the client um, as much as I can. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, for us, it's, we, it's kind of, I mean, we try and off the bat kind of just our price is what it is, you know what I mean? But we know the products that we use throughout, we're not going to go really on the cheaper route, I should say, or less, less expensive. We kind of make that known off the bat too. Cause we, we explain, you know, when I list out everything too, prior to a build, I mean, they're seeing literally every single detail, like on the insulation thing, we do all spray in, you know, spray foam insulation. That's our standard. So we're starting with that standard. I mean, our, our baseboards, we don't do any fake moldings or any, we do all wood moldings too. Um, you know, cause just in case it could, obviously down here, we have a lot of moisture that stuff's going to expand and contrast. We don't want to deal with that. 
front doors, same thing. We've been doing a lot of uh, metal front doors versus anything with wood or fiberglass because of the expansion issues and stuff. Metal can be a little bit more money, but we're willing to do that and tell them up front. So it's a lot of explaining at the beginning too of why we're doing what we're doing and the cost you know that they're paying versus other builders i can get it cheaper over here you know why are you guys at this level too same with appliances i mean we're not making any extra money off appliances but we'd rather start with a better known appliance that doesn't have any issues right off you know that compared to the cheaper version that some of these guys are putting in so it's just little things like that that you can do um Anything else on that topic, guys, before I move to the next one? Good to go. Um, so we kind of brush on this, and it, it's important to guide customers from start to finish in the process. So what can we do to guide people better throughout the process? I mean, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but let's dig deeper into it because it's such a big thing. So guiding people throughout the process, what can we do better? Designers, <laughs> I'm a designer. Uh, I, when I started building houses 18, 19 years ago, I helped people pick stuff out. Trust me, I'm not the guy you want helping you pick what colors go in your house. It'll be very masculine, and that's not <laughs> exactly what your wife's going to want. So um, a good designer helps a lot with the guiding process. Um, the other thing is, know your processes. Have them written down. Have procedures. This is when we do this. This is when we do this. This is when we do this. And stick to them. You know, hey, by X time, we have to have figured out what flooring we're going to put in. Um, by this time, we have to know what the paint colors are. You know, um, our designer has been great with us in that aspect because they come in, they pick everything but their lighting pretty much in one day. Um, they spend the day with her. We've got samples of everything. So they spend the day with her, go through them all, and she's got a form she uses and she just checks them off. They want this, they want this, they want this. Um, and I think that's the easiest way to better guide a customer know the process do the process follow through with the customer yeah i think somebody mentioned it earlier about the uh the expectations you know from the very beginning set those expectations um if you tell them hey you know I, there's going to be times where i'm not going to have somebody on your project for a day maybe a couple days as long as you set those expectations with the client um, I think that's, you know, I think that's kind of starting off on the right foot. If they expect somebody there every single day from seven in the morning till they're going to get disappointed pretty, pretty early, at least for, you know, the way that we, we do things here on, on the beach, I guess. Um, so just the expectations, in my opinion, that's one of the biggest things and the communication and we've talked about that several times, but those two things, um, are huge and you know I, I feel for me it's it's my job to kind of walk them through that whole project uh, Damian I use the your designers um, but you know for me going out looking at the tile with with the clients looking at the light fixtures um, I don't know I, I think it I don't know for me I, I just I just think it adds a, a little bit of an element and it just, you know, they're able to bounce questions off me that I can answer on the field. How will that impact their, how will that impact their shower? How will that impact their kitchen? Um, so sure. I take it kind of on myself just to, um, you know, walk them through the whole process. And, you know, it's, it's tough going to three different tile stores and, you know, two different countertop, you know, stores to pick out something very time consuming. Um, but I feel like I can answer a lot of questions and build that rapport with them. Definitely. Um, now, I just because I'm running a lot, I, I, I got two or three projects going on, so it's uh, I, I don't have as many projects. So um, it's it's uh, just because I have a designer, don't mean that I'm not there. Yeah, well, I'm I go there. to 
99% of all design we do. Same way, if there's a question on, hey, how much is it to upgrade this? Yeah. I can answer it, or hey, we want to change this, this feature in the house so that we can use this product. How much would yeah. that be? So, so yeah, uh, I right. did on the designer because she takes the weight off of me as far sure. as what it's yeah. going to look like at the end. But I'm still there to answer all the questions. Gotcha. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, just going back to, I think the expectations and that communication that we've talked about several times. Um, I think that, you know, setting those things from the very beginning of the projects, it's huge. Brad. Um, I don't know if there's a, like a whole lot that I can add that we haven't chatted about or these guys haven't said. Um, I agree that you have to set out like a visual roadmap to what the process looks like. Um, like I touched on earlier, our clients have access to the live schedule. So as it's changing, they can see it. They can see it before we even start. They can see it throughout. They can see it as things are changing. Um, and so they can really understand like the step-by-step -step process of what's happening um, because they can see it live. If there's something like weather that's happened, they're going to understand why things are backlogged a little bit. They live here too. So they understand, okay, well, it was 40 below for six weeks. That's why things got pushed back, but they can see it live happening. It's not like they find it out at the end. It's not like their possession date comes and, and we're like, oh, we're not even close to being done yet because of this back two months ago. Like they have full access to it. So I think that transparency is important. Um, and you just, I think you need to do whatever, you, whatever is humanly possible in your power to make them feel comfortable and make them trust you. Um, because for us, our, like I said, our, I, I know Bill, our clients are in totally different demographics, but for us, um, site visits are limited to be honest. Like we rarely do, we normally do like four or five throughout the entire build process. And that's the only time that they're on site. Um, and we've thought about trying to increase those, but the reality is that all of our people are young working professionals and they don't have the time to get off work all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we do weekends occasionally, but there's, you just don't have the time of the day to meet all the clients in the evenings and, and on weekends. So having, building that trust and rapport right from the beginning and doing everything that you can to help them and be transparent so that that trust is built. Um, so that they feel comfortable with the product that you're building and putting out and having those referrals like Damien was talking about and making sure that your past clients are happy and, and things like that. Um, it goes a really long way. Yeah. And I mean, on both, on all perspectives too, like what Damien said to interior designer, it's a big help. I mean, we work with them too, especially on some of the larger, probably, I think we got four projects now with a big design firm we're working with and it, it's made things 10 times easier. You give them the budgets, they know what to go for. They know what selections, the prices and where they got to be in too, or, you know, the ballpark they got to be in. Um, and then on Jake's end too, uh, some of these, some of the times too, it's, I have to be there personally too with the customer because it's the trust factor on that end. They trust me because they were with me at the beginning and I can tell them to go with something that they might have not have went with with one of our girls in house that does the design for us too. So it kind of works in all different ways. Um, you know, so it, it it's in the end, it's just, yeah, it's being there for them throughout the process like we've all talked about. And that's a lot of great info. Any any other things on that before moving on, guys? Awesome. And so Damien talked about this a little bit earlier. So let's talk after the build. And, you know, in I, we've discussed this in past episodes too, but let's dive a little deeper into it. It's important to continue relationships after, you know, after the build and to, to gain future business and then also keep the relationships going throughout, you know, like with us, for example, we've built customers second homes, you know, or even third homes and that for some, in some instances too. Uh, how can we all do this better and maintain the relationships with customers after the fact? Exceed the expectation. We've got customers that we've built five houses for. Uh, just exceeding the expectation. 
I, I, I mean, I think one thing is like from a warranty perspective, you have to be as timely as you possibly can. Uh, like get in there when you, when you do get a call or when you do follow up, we're doing, we actually are implementing the same thing that you were talking about, Damien. We haven't, we were waiting for phone calls, but uh, we started implementing a couple of years or a couple of years, a couple of months ago to, to be the initiator in those calls. Um, so I think timeliness is important, but one of the things that we do that's, I think kind of out of the box is, and it actually came from a client of ours. It was her idea. I, we can't take, uh, we can't take credit for it. My wife, this may not make any sense to you guys, especially being men, but they're, uh, they started a women's splurge group. So basically all of our women buyers, uh, once a month they go out together and do something different. Like they could go out for drinks or they go do some sort of class of some sort. Um, and whoever, whoever picks the event, uh, that month, all the other women pitch in 20 bucks and the 20 bucks goes to this, the person who picked the event for the month and they get to go buy like something for themselves that they wouldn't go buy elsewhere. Um, and those kind of groups are really popular up here. Lots of women put those kind of groups together, but it's a way for us to be always in constant contact with our past customers in a non-business uh, setting at all. It's more of like a friendship setting. Uh, so it's a way to number one, always keep us in mind, but then also create more of more like friendships than, than a client and customer client and, uh, and build their type of relationship. It takes it away from business and more to the personal side. So something you need. Yeah. I think we talked about it. Last question is just, um, you know, building that trust. So, for me, um, it's just really showing the client that, you know, I sincerely care about them and I'm building a friendship with them. So we've implemented, you know, send out birthday cards, send out Christmas cards. Um, I've done, you know, I've done condo renovations and, and one specific condo complex. I've done like eight or nine different projects in there. Every time I'm there, I'll go knock on two or three of the, you know, the, the previous client's doors just to see if they're there, seeing how they're doing. Um, seeing, you know, making sure everything's working, working properly, if they have any issues, have any concerns. So uh, just really showing clients that we care. Uh, we're not in it, you know, just to, for, for the money, but just to build those friendships with them. And um, I, I don't know, just to build the friendships with, with my previous clients. Anything else, guys? No. Okay. Um, and finally, just to keep this moving, last question, I always ask this on every episode, what exactly do people need to look for prior to buying a new home or building a new home in your areas? Start with I think, Damien. I think the first thing is proper fit, the proper relationship between the uh, customer and the builder, the, the buyer and the builder. Um, if that's not a good match, it's not going to be a fun experience, and it should be. Um, I think I said it the same way on the last time we talked. Mm -hmm. it's most people's most expensive purchase. And it should be one of your most enjoyable purchases. And, you know, you go and you buy a car. Most people enjoy picking out things they want in their car. That's enjoyable. House should be the same. It should be enjoyable. Um, and if you don't have a good match, don't do it. Wait. Bump the brakes. Make sure you get the fit. Um, make sure it's going to be something that's an enjoyable experience to work together. Um, interview multiple builders to make sure that you get that warm feeling that you know that you can trust this individual and they're going to do what they say they're going to do and that they can offer you references. I mean, like I said earlier, we want to earn the right to have the right to ask for a reference. So, um, we offer to all of our customers when they come in, want to talk about custom building or they just want to purchase a house. I offer all of them references um, our one of our lending partners is a customer of ours so we refer customers
customers to him for the mortgage on their homes. And I tell them all the time, ask Steve how the process works. Ask him how it went. Um, we built two homes for him and uh, he, he will tell you we do what we say we're gonna do and we try to make it the most enjoyable experience you'll have. I agree. I, um, to me, it comes down to experience. I think that for the most part, um, people in our area know, know quality, what kind of quality they're going to get for what builder they're going to choose. Um, if you want, if you want a cheap house built, people know builders that will do that. If you want a fancy, luxurious, high quality house, you know, who's going to do that and everyone in between. Um, it's just a small enough, we have a small enough city where reputation goes around fast enough um, that, that the public knows who builds quality and who doesn't. Um, so I think, I think they can figure that out. But the one missing piece that I tell everyone is make sure that you're going to build with somebody who's going to give you the good experience. Um, because you hear the stories all the time, how stressful building a home is. And it shouldn't be that way. Like if, if the ducks are in a row, it shouldn't be stressful, especially not for the customer anyway. <laughs> the customer should never, ever feel that stress. So uh, it comes back to that experience and, and fitting property like Damien was saying. Yeah, I completely agree with several of those things. Um, you know, building and remodeling, it's not a quick process, you know, even for remodels, you know, four or five, six months. So I tell people, hey, we're, you know, we're, we're almost like a marriage. You know, you're going to be talking to me several times a week. I want to be calling you. You know, you're going to need stuff from me. So, um, you know, we got to get along. We got to enjoy it. You know, not only does the client have to trust us, you know, we have to feel comfortable and trust the client as well. You know, I've turned down several projects just because I didn't want to, I didn't feel like the, that bond was there. So um, it's important to have that connection. Um, and then just, you know, our company, we really try to strive to just hold their hand out through that, you know, hold their hand through the whole process. Um, you know, I've said it on the previous podcast as well, you know, remodeling construction, it can be challenging, but, um, you know, our job, my, one of the reasons I started the remodeling company is because it doesn't have to be challenging. It can be fun and it can be enjoyable. So, uh, you know, both of you guys said, said exactly what was on my mind. It's awesome. Yeah, guys, this has been very good as usual, just like past episodes. I really appreciate you guys coming on. Um, just final thing too, uh, we'll just go around real quick, just in case they didn't catch the last episodes. Where can they find you guys as far as social media wise? Start with you, Damien. Uh, we're at Handmade Homes on Facebook. Um, I believe we're at Handmade Homes LLC on Instagram um, website handmadehomes.us awesome brad uh we're on facebook and instagram uh so facebook is spruce homes and instagram is at uh, spruce homes yxe okay and jake yeah revive properties llc on facebook and instagram and then uh, reviveyourproperty.com is our is our website Awesome. Awesome. Thanks again, guys, for coming on another episode of The Real Build. A lot of good value, as usual. First ever panel discussion. I'm sure we'll do this again in the future, I hope. Um, so thanks again, guys. And we will see everybody on the next episode.